Welcome all back to the C40 Talks within the climate change thematic session here at uh, Smart City Expo. I'm uh, very glad to uh, introduce these three sessions on climate change. First, we will start with a session on equitable cities, moderated by Frederic Chimeno from the Barcelona City Council. Then we will have a session on air pollution, moderated by Mark Watts, the executive director of C40. And then there will be a networking break here in this room. We are, you are all welcome to stay, followed by a last panel on the role of cities in developing countries to fight climate change, both mitigation and adaptation, moderated by myself. I am Luigi Garafa from the Climate Infrastructure Partnership. So with, with no further ado, I will uh, invite the first panel to come to the stage. And I will give the floor first to Frederic Chimeno. So thank you very much. Hello, thank you, Luigi. Good morning. Uh, after the uh, inspiring session of our mayors, uh, we start this, uh, this um, panel, as Luigi said. And uh, we start with the uh, opening remarks. Uh, and I will I wish to give the floor to Elena Vishner Malinovska. She's head of adaptation of uh, the uh, 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 adaptation unit of DG Klima of European Commission, and will offer us uh, the, uh, her, her thoughts. Thank you, Elena. Please. Hola, buenos dias. Uh, I'm very happy to be here and actually I'm very lucky, uh, considering myself very lucky because I lived in my life in very livable and beautiful cities like the city of Brussels, city of Paris, city of Vienna, Bratislava and so on and so forth. But today my task is to tell you what European Union is doing in uh, in, in favor of cities. But first of all, I would like to emphasize that European Union, we have a very strong trunk record in climate policies. Uh, we consider ourselves still a climate leader in the world. And I hope I, did, I didn't offend any non-Europeans here in the room. Because we have committed to reduce emission at least by 40% by 2030. And we have also a story to share, a story that says that what is ecological can be also economic, because during the period from 1990s till 2016, we have reduced emissions by 23%, whilst the economy was still allowed to grow. But we shouldn't stop at 2030. As you know, we all pack now our luggage to go to Poland for the next climate conference of parties, where we hope that the work on implementing and really bringing Paris Agreement in, into life will be done. But Europe will bring with, uh, in the luggage also its long-term strategy. And I can tell you this long-term strategy has been prepared in full consultation with number of parties and stakeholders, with businesses, with researchers. So we know what inclusivity means in Europe. And acting very early with stakeholders has no price whatsoever. It is very useful to disseminate information, to get a very early buying. So uh, to say uh, we all have responsibility for that. A few weeks ago, you have probably read the call by scientists about uh, the climate impacts. And there was a quote that I will use that says, this means that we have to act now, idiots. Everybody turned to politicians thinking these are the politicians who have to act. I'm sorry to say, we are all those that were addressed in this quote, and we all have to act now. Now, the just transition concerns us all, and countries and cities have to start designing policies that minimize the economic and social disruptive impacts that come from climate change, and that really maximize 
the benefits. And in Europe, I, I'll mention you three examples how we go about with the just transition. First of all, we have launched a call transition uh, platform which brings people together and looks at what we can do in the call intensive regions. Because unless you do something in these regions, you haven't managed the climate transformation. Second, you can use the revenues, member states can use the revenues coming from the uh, European trading scheme and they can use it actually to promote skill formation, to reallocate labor that is affected by transformation. And also we have a modernization fund where at least 70% of receipts should go to regions affected by, uh, by energy transition. I would like to say that in the coming weeks and months, all your member states, European member states, will have to prepare their long-term national energy and climate plans. And they are bound to consult you, to consult the civil society. Uh, so please, claim it. And it's very important that more and more we go forward, local authorities have their plans. And you have heard this morning in the session how many plants any of the cities that were present do. It is also important that um, states and cities start to do the social mapping. As I said, climate uh, change is unfair. It impacts us in different ways. And it's important to have policies that are designed for socially vulnerable groups. And we are not short in examples. We have already few cities in Europe that are doing very systemic social mapping, like some cities in uh, Slovakia or Helsinki. We have also the bottom-up uh, initiative, Covenant of Mayors, that is really of importance to us because it brings different cities together and tries to share the expertise. And I would like to invite the local authorities, if there are some and that are still not part of the Covenant, please join because it is important you are in there. Next, we cannot do the energy transition without investments, right? And we need private sector to be committed to that. And that's why we have uh, launched in Europe the so-called Sustainable Finance Action Plan. And this is very important to have the asset managers, to have investors, to have insurance on board, because they can help to uh, go through the structural breaks. Now, is Europe ready for climate risks? Well, at least on paper, it is. We just evaluated our European adaptation strategy and the result says, indeed, we, have, we can tick the boxes on all accounts when it comes to decision making, when it comes to climate proofing of some policies, and when it comes to action by member states. But is it enough? Well, well, well. The findings tell us that we should also uh, consider much more urgency the impact we already live now. You heard in the session uh, the minister, Spanish minister, sending condolences to California. We had similar cases in Sweden, in uh, France, in Spain, in Portugal, and the list goes on and on. And indeed, as we go along, the impacts will unfold with much more frequency. So indeed, what we have to do in the future is to continue with the action of reducing drastically emissions, but actually also adapting and increasing our resilience. And to conclude, I would like to conclude with a quote I like very much, because adaptability is about the powerful difference between adapting to cope and adapting to win. And I hope we will be all winners at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. Then uh, we, to speak about these issues, how, how we, from the cities, we work on just transition uh, and how we connect policies of adaptation, resiliency with fight uh, against inequality and, and to put the vulnerable people.
people in the center of the action. Uh, I would like to invite the, the, the members of this um, panel. Uh, Daniel, Evelyn, Eugenia, if you can do the, uh, come to the floor. Uh, we have three uh, excellent, uh, ex um, uh, ex excellent uh, ex examples from three cities, three cities that are working uh, on climate uh, uh, from this perspective. Uh, Daniel Rees is the political advisor uh, to Deputy Mayor of Oslo. Uh, Evelyn Jung uh, is a strategic policy advisor uh, su um, for sustainability and circular economy uh, of the uh, city of Amsterdam. And Evgenia Semutnikova uh, is deputy uh, head of the Department of Natural Res Resources and Environmental Protection from um, Moscow. Then Amsterdam, uh, again, Amsterdam, uh, Oslo and uh, uh, and Moscow. Uh, I would like to start, if you are, I agree with David. <laughs> uh, Oslo is working uh, on the client on the carbon budget. This is a very interesting in initiative. Uh, I, I said to you before that we are looking for what is doing Oslo to. Uh, import uh, for uh, for the next budget on Barcelona. Can you explain us uh, something about your this 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 project? Sure. Thank you very much. And um, I think the the most difficult thing about climate mm. policy isn't to set ambitious targets or make a strategy. It's actually making it happen day by day. And uh, I think for too long, climate policy has been about setting goals too far into the future so that we basically can leave them to the next woman or guy to pick up and deliver on later on. And this approach, of course, doesn't work when the IPCC tells us we have to cut emissions by 50% over the next decade or so. Um, but also, I think it fails to, um, to really engage uh, citizens and also uh, businesses because um, they, don't, they have to trust the government and trust that these changes are actually happening. They need uh, long-term um, uh, predictability. And of course, I think we already have a system in, in place to sort out these kind of challenges, and that is the budget process. That's how, we, how we, s we, we make sure that we don't spend more money than we have. And so what we have done in Oslo is that we have made, a, as a part of the, the fiscal budget, we have made a climate budget. Where, uh, and it's three important parts in this uh, system. The first is that we set a maximum amount of emissions from the city area per year. So it's not some, somewhere far into the future, it's short term. So we need, we need to show progress how we're gonna meet our long-term goal. Uh, the second part of the climate budget is that it consists uh, a, a list of all the different measures that we are doing and are planning to do to actually be able to deliver. And, um, and uh, this part is important because it shows us and answers the question, are we doing enough or do we have to do more? Uh, and very often the, the answer, of course, is that we have to do more, but then it, this is very transparent. And finally, uh, it also uh, shows us very clearly who is responsible in the city government for carrying this policy out. And, um, and um, basically the, the uh, experience so far in Oslo is that this system is working. We see that emissions are falling. Last uh, year of official statistics, they were down by 8%. Um, now we have uh, agencies reporting three times a year on how they are delivering on their uh, responsible measures. So this is really uh, uh, elevating climate to uh, the top uh, awareness of everybody working for the city government. And, um, and uh, also it makes it possible for the citizens and for businesses and also for the, for the opposition in City Hall to know what's going on and to also continuously challenge uh, us to move forward so so uh, it's uh, nice to hear that Barcelona we just talked about this uh, just before we came on stage uh, are thinking or looking into similar systems and we have also been in touch with others who are uh, interested in learning more about this and from Oslo side we are very um, we, we highly recommend developing s a system like this and we are happy to assist in any way uh, possible and um, 
we um, also think it would have been cool uh, next time we meet uh, at the C40 summit if we could have more cities that have been uh, committed to, to uh, developing a climate budget or some sort of similar governance tool. So we could share experiences and, uh, and also challenge uh, the national governments to deliver similar sort of systems. Yeah. Uh, when when uh, cities w uh, work uh, in a network, no, we have uh, more uh, capacities and we share uh, good uh, and interesting ideas. Thank you, David. Evelyn, uh, Amsterdam uh, is, is a, a leader on circular economy and, and another interesting uh, policies, but I would like to, uh, uh, to ask you about this issue. No? How, uh, what is the key element of the, the circular economy strategy and, uh, and, and how this is uh, um, uh, going to the, the give benefits for the communities and, this, and um, for this idea of, transi of just and effective transition? Well, okay. it starts, of course, with uh, political leadership and with collective leadership <laughs> when we started to think about a circular strategy. Uh, I think that's really for every city the starting point, uh, showing leadership on the short, short term as well as on the longer uh, term. And what we did in Amsterdam, we started uh, as the first city worldwide in 2015 to realize an in-depth research into the potential of a circular economy and ask ourselves the main question, uh, could or should we have a role as a local government? And yes, we have uh, a crucial role to play in order to realize a circular economy. And the conclusion out of that research was that we have to focus on a couple of value chains because it's not about individual waste streams. It's about the whole value chain, it's about cross-sectoral approach, uh, it's about a multi-stakeholder approach. So as we decided to focus on the building and construction value chain, as well as on the biomass and the food value chain. And that of course links directly to the citizens' needs to provide them with uh, healthy homes, uh, provide them with um, sustainable and healthy food to mention some examples. So in the last couple of years, with a lot of stakeholders, with citizens, we realized 73 circular projects. And that is about circular procurement, of course. It's about uh, circular buildings, but it's also about circular city district. And in Amsterdam, we have in the northern part a bottom-up initiative. So that's about citizens' needs to choose their own way in order to realize circular and healthy uh, homes. Um, but it's also about consumer goods um, and also affects directly what it's about affordability when we speak about climate change. So can we use consumer goods uh, in different ways? Can we repair them? Can we reuse them? Can we share them? Also aspects of a circular economy. And by the end of last year, we evaluated all those projects, and the main conclusion is that a circular economy is um, uh, within reach, it's profitable, and we can and have to do and to realize that. Also, because the only way to reach the Paris Agreement is by changing our economic system. So in Amsterdam, we're now in a phase that we have to scale up, and uh, I see a lot of initiatives uh, in neighborhoods that are so committed to realize this because it affects our daily lives. Uh, it is about affor affordability. It is about access to all our basic needs. So that's what's happening in Amsterdam now uh, underground. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Evelyn. We, we are looking uh, for your experience in your 73 uh, project. I think it's very exciting and interesting to, 
uh, for all of our, of our cities to understand how the people are living in this in this uh, project. No? Thank you, uh, Virginia. Uh, Moscow have, uh, has implemented an, uh, uh, an Im ambitious infrastructure plan. No? My street project is the name. My street, uh, no, I think, uh, to revi uh, revitalize the, the center and the riverfront. No? Uh, what is your balance? Your, no, your balance of this project and, uh, and uh, what, mm, what benefits you consider your neighbor has uh, have uh, on mm -hmm. the implementation of this project? Da. Дорогие друзья, в начале слова благодарности прекрасной Барселоне и все 40 за возможность принять участие в этом событии высокого уровня. Проект «Моя улица» — это один из масштабных проектов правительства Москвы. 333 улицы было благоустроено и общественных пространств. Это больше 300 километров протяженности и порядка 2000 гав площадной оценки. При этом огромный объем был сделан в основном, в основном за два года. Это крайне быстро. Целью проекта было восстановить историческое озеленение на улицах там, где последние 30-40 лет его не было, но раньше оно было. Целью было ряд улиц преобразовать в полностью пешеходные. А на улицах, которые всегда считались самыми крупными автомобильными трафиками, сузить пространство для автомобилей и существенно расширить пространство для пешеходов, сделав эти пространства комфортными и комфортными для гуляния по городу. Конечно, когда такой невероятный объем работ делается крайне быстро, это неудобство. Это неудобство. И поэтому одной из задач правительства Москвы было, как, как же преодолеть это неудобство, как же объяснить людям, как же заручиться их поддержкой. И у нас в 2014 году, в 2014 было создано несколько информационных платформ для общения с жителями, с нашими москвичами, где пригодными для того, чтобы спрашивать их мнение. Одной из них — это платформа «Активный гражданин», где люди высказывались. И еще до начала проекта «Моя улица» люди выбирали улицу, голосовали через этот ресурс, какие улицы включать в эту программу. Люди обсуждали стандарты благоустройства, люди выбирали и выражали свое мнение по поводу внешнего вида элементов благоустройства, элементов комфорта на общественных пространствах. И потом все эти решения ложились в проектные решения по этой улице. Таким образом… Мы фактически затеяв такой большой ремонт в собственной квартире, показали людям, что они получат результат, которого они хотят. Это первый очень важный момент, едва ли не важнее, чем вот показатели количественно реализованного проекта. И второе, это, конечно, надо было решать это очень быстро. Были консолидированы ресурсы с объемом порядка 70 миллиардов рублей в год на благоустройство, чтобы это неудобство сделать как можно короче для людей. И помимо того, что люди выбирали этот проект, фактически формировали его, они потом оценивали этот проект через тот же ресурс. И поддержка по различным улицам реализованных проектов составляла от 83 до 90 процентов из тех, кто голосовал на этом портале. При этом надо сказать, что если на момент создания портала там было всего лишь полмиллиона людей, то сейчас и в оценке вот этих голосований приняло больше двух миллионов. Это примерно там пятая, шестая часть населения Москвы. Это не так мало за вычетом, если вычесть детей, членов семьи по одному представителю семьи. То есть можно говорить об очень широком охвате. И а, кроме проекта, мы, конечно, очень важно, вот вы задали вопрос о климатических выгодах. Конечно, не надо питать иллюзию о том, что только ради климатических выгод абстрактных люди поддержат идею. Поэтому мы всегда стараемся показывать корреспондирующий эффект от понятных людь людям выгод. А какие выгоды? У нас пешеходные, объем пешеходного движения увеличился три раза. Объем велосипедного движения в несколько раз. Трафик у нас уменьшился. А если у нас раньше на один квадратный метр общественного пространства было в одну минуту больше 12 человек, то сейчас этот показатель 7, при том, что какой-то объем пешеходного движения увеличил. Люди вышли жить на улицу, люди уже не живут в квартиру. Они эти общественные пространства полюбили. 
и а, мы сопровождали эту информацию, информацию о роли немедицинских факторов для здоровья, о снижении загрязнения за счет снижения трафика и повышения, повышения доли велосипедного и пешеходного движения. У нас была сделана большая работа, связанная с оценкой в деньгах последствий изменения климата и роли озеленения в этой истории. И люди понимали, что их комфорт, дает корреспондирующим эффектам очень моральную вещь, моральную вещь в виде борьбы с изменениями климата. И э, «Моя улица» — один из масштабных проектов, он потрясает скоростью масштабных изменений. Но мы по такой же схеме реализуем еще один проект «Миллион деревьев», когда люди выбирают дворы, в которых они хотят, чтобы им посадили деревья, и выбирают породы деревьев в дворах. То есть они фактически сами формируют свой двор. Огромный проект «Реновация», 25 миллионов квадратных метров за 20 лет планируется старых домов обновить. Люди сами на том же информационном портале выбирали дома, хотят они этого, не хотят. И сейчас у нас стартует программа, аналогичная программа «Моя улица», только она называется «Мой район», целью которого является уравнять комфорт и блага для жителей в каждом из районов, огромной Москвы, а это 12 миллионов и практически 250 квадратных километров. Это огромный мегаполис. И цель стоит сделать так, чтобы в любом районе, даже в периферийном, комфорт был жителями ощутим. И при этом они понимали эффект, связанный со снижением воздействия на климат. The city that that we need, no, and uh, we need to to improve the green infrastructure in our cities, no, and, and to uh, reduce uh, traffic, no, and it's a, a very interesting project, uh, and an an interesting uh, process to do <laughs> this project, no, quick. This is not easy for all of us, no, to do in a short time, uh, and with the the, uh, the participation of, of people. Thank you, Virginia. Um, very interesting. You will be uh, looking mm -hmm. for your evolution also. Uh, we, I, I think we have time for another question for uh, uh, all of you. Um, uh, David, in Oslo, uh, your, your uh, um, goal is to reduce 90% uh, um, emissions by 2030. Uh, and is a, uh, It's a, uh, it's a very uh, ambitious goal, no? uh, and mm, together with Vancouver, uh, another city of C40, you are working on, on, this, uh, on this idea of uh, uh, just transition. No? And uh, how do you connect this uh, ambitious climate uh, or reduction emissions goal with uh, this idea that we, we need to build Uh, just transition with employer workers with your communities. Can you tell us a few words about that? Sure. Um, it's um, as I mentioned in the, in the, at the Global Climate Action Summit, uh, our mayor uh, signed a uh, just transition sort of declaration together with the head of the largest trade federation in uh, uh, in Norway, and uh, and. Um, In Norway, we have quite a good tradition of working together between the government and the uh, labor unions and uh, businesses. And the challenge, of course, is to uh, build on this when we now have to uh, make a very rapid change over the, over the next coming decades. And this is a big challenge in Norway, you can imagine, because we have a huge oil and gas industry sector that will have to um, be uh, gradually built down over time in order to reach the Paris uh, agreements. But uh, just a couple of examples on, on uh, I mean, The, the main uh, focus on this uh, in this declaration is to to develop a, uh, uh, or, uh, a strong channel of dialogue between the government and the the workers, uh, and also and ensure that they are early involved in these processes and the pl and planning for what's going to happen. So, two quick examples is um, in the transport sector with um, automation uh, and self-driving buses, for example, mm. that could be a challenge. Or is, I think, perceived increasingly as a challenge for people who have the job as driving the bus. So, so we need to have a dialogue and, and discuss what this means for them, and uh, they have to understand that this is not um, 
not something we are doing to make their life more difficult. We want to help them in the, in the case, for example, there are less jobs in that sector. We need to provide training or, that or other f um, help so that they can have new opportunities. A uh, second example is we are now next year in 2019, we are expanding the toll ring uh, around Oslo. So we are building 53 new toll stations, which is going to be a, uh, an interesting <laughs> um, thing. Uh, but uh, uh, I think for many people, they experience this as um, um, a challenge for them if, the, if they don't have money to pay. Uh, and, uh, and then it's uh, a very important part of this um, um, sort of uh, approach is to make sure that we have enough alternatives for people, Th that public transport is available, that bicycle lanes are available and safe, and, and also that um, businesses can have support from the city government to, uh, for example, build a, a bicycle parking or uh, showering facilities or electrical vehicle charging points or other sort of uh, um, um, measures to, yeah, so to help the transition. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. It's a, uh, it's, it's, it's a challenge no, to, to uh, grow together uh, this, this uh, climate action uh, with this social point of view. Uh, well, um, uh, Evelyn, we, we are here from Barcelona. We are high expectative with new mayor. No? Is a woman, is interesting, another woman leading uh, our, our, one of our important cities in Europe, uh, Ms. Femke Hanselma, I don't know if I, I said mm -hmm. well, uh, uh, share with us um, some uh, uh, priorities and, uh, of, the, of this new administration on climate and environment. No? Uh, well, we have a very ambition ambitious mayor and deputy mayors. Uh, in total, we have a city board of uh, eight people. Um, and we set some very ambitious uh, targets. To start with, uh, we want to be uh, fully climate neutral and circular in 2050. Uh, we want to get uh, rid of natural gas by 2040. And we are going to realize uh, emission-free transportation by 2025. Uh, so these are very high targets, and what I said in the beginning, that also uh, needs political and collective leadership. Um, and key words in our um, 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 political agreement, so to say, are uh, participation, it's about uh, solidarity, it's about justice, it's about equality. Because we all know that all these major changes uh, needs very high investments. And we have to make sure that this transition still is affordable for everyone and that everyone has access, uh, for example, to uh, sustainable energy. So that's the reason that we also have put uh, a whole, say, set of policy instruments in place, uh, like financial instruments to help uh, citizens to buy solar panels so that it's not for the happy few, that electrical cars are not for the happy few, but that African, everyone can afford them as well as, of course, public transport. But we also know that in this transition, uh, there will be also losses, losses of jobs, for instance, and that we have to provide and uh, develop new kinds of jobs. So that's the reason that we uh, have recently published a new research outcome uh, called Circular Jobs. So we looked into what kind of new jobs can we provide and have to provide and what types of skills and competences are needed so that we also can change the educational system and that we help every citizen to connect to the right education in order to find the right job. And what we also know in a circular economy is that we need more, say, manufacturing jobs, more dedicated um, knowledge around materials, around repairing. So it offers also a lot of opportunities. Um, but I think we, have, uh, we are obliged to realize that together with the private sector, together with the education uh, for the schools, uh, the, the, the universities, etc., etc. Um, 
So affordability and a just system are key. And also when we realize that we only have just one planet Earth and that we have to live within the planetary boundaries, um, that we um, have to provide present and next generations with uh, access to all the basic needs in a sustainable and just way. And I do believe that it is the only way to reach uh, future-proof and inclusive cities. And that's what we're going to do together. Okay, uh, I think we share this uh, ambition and this uh, challenge. Uh, and we follow the leaders. <laughs> uh, okay, thank you, uh, Eugenia. Uh, like another cities, mm, Barcelona uh, also, uh, in Moscow you have uh, an air pollution uh, problems and challenge uh, with problems with health. Uh, how, how do you, uh, what is your deal and how you make front of this challenge in Moscow? Качество воздуха – это бесспорный приоритет любых мегаполисов, крупных, не крупных, не мегаполисов, и в политике правительства Москвы он тоже нашел свое отражение. Мы говорим о том, что в предшествующий период с 2010 года, с 2010 года у нас снижение составило порядка 20% по разным загрязняющим веществам, где-то больше, где-то меньше, и по мелким взвешенным, и по диоксиду серы, и по оксидам азота. Но остается проблема превышения диоксида в азота среднесуточных концентраций вблизи автотрасс, поэтому это определяет наши задачи. И мы внимательно, очень внимательно провели работу. Это было в рамках разработки проекта экологической стратегии Москвы до 2030 года, где мы установили ряд целевых показателей, просчитанных целей и просчитанных резервов. Вот по самым скромным подсчетам еще на 30% снизить загрязнение воздуха легко и возможно. И вот эти цели, они подтверждаются не просто документом написанным, либо мои славами здесь сейчас, они подтверждаются делами. Первое, конечно, это реформа нашей транспортной системы, и мы говорим о том, что, как и большинство городов, мы это делаем не только в целях снижения трафика, но и в целях улучшения качества атмосферного воздуха. И здесь достигнуты колоссальные результаты за счет мер, платная парковка, жесткий контроль качества топлива, резкое улучшение экологического класса автомашин, резкое сокращение, резкое сокращение частного трафика и, конечно, самое главное – это развитие общественного транспорта. В общественном транспорте у нас цели с 2021 года перейти только на электрические автобусы. При этом с этого года началось уже постепенное замещение парка автобусов муниципального транспорта на электротранспорт. Очень много сил тратится на развитие метро. В предыдущую пятилетку 56 станций метро было введено, это колоссальный объем, и в следующие пять лет планируется еще 67 станций. При этом вот в этом году он для нас очень важный, для тех, кто заботится об экологии климата, потому что у нас появились первые станции метро, которые целиком обеспечены теплом за счет геотермального тепла на тепловых насосов. То есть это второе направление, это строительство экологичное с увеличением доли возобновляемой энергетики. Эти показатели тоже есть, даже на уровне таких, как станции метро. И если нам удастся реализовать это на большинстве 60 станций в следующую пятилетку, это будет колоссальное изменение баланса в сторону возобновляемой энергетики. Промышленность. Москва остается крупным промышленным центром, потому что это экономика, это рабочие места, и принято решение не отказываться от этого, как это легко было бы все это вывести за черту города, но не легко, а дорого, и это повлияло бы на экономику. Поэтому цель – это вывести только грязные производства, а те, которые готовы за свой счет реконструироваться, реконструируются. У нас каждое крупное предприятие имеет свою инвестиционную программу реконструкции со значительным эффектом снижения выбросов. Это промышленность. Четвертое направление крайне важное, я только крупными по крупным направлениям, да, вот как у нас стоят цели в политике Москвы, это эффективное использование земель. В Москве исторически 12 тысяч га это 
это пространства, которые раньше были заняты промзоны, они не очень эффективны. Сейчас имеется программа по превращению их в комфортные общественные пространства, и стоит целевой показатель 15% обязательного озеленения вот этих территорий, как резерв дополнительного озеленения. И а, когда мы защищали эти цифры, а это тоже надо защищать, потому что всегда есть столкновение экономических интересов, это очевидно, особенно со строительным комплексом, мы, конечно, в корреспонденцию рассчитывали эффект, связанный для здоровья, и эффект, связанный с сокращением выбросов парниковых газов, и, а, и насколько эти меры встроены в планы по адаптации к изменениям климата. И эта работа тоже ведется. Вот, если я ответила на вопрос, я готова поподробнее, если есть время, либо вопросы. Of course, thank you very much. I think it's a, a panoramic vision. Thank you very it's a, interesting for us. Well, I think that it's clear that when we work on uh, on, uh, on climate action, we are working to make more healthy cities, more livable, more with less inequality, with more solidarity. You know? Then uh, I think this this connection is clear. The the climate action is not a uh, uh, is not disconnect with the better cities, uh, and and is not it can be and is not disconnect with this idea of uh, uh, of more equa uh, uh, more equal cities uh, and more fair cities, mm, and I think uh, all of the, our panelists uh, show that we are fear fearless cities. We want to lead. We want to work on that. We want to do that with our citizens, uh, with their participation and, and, and their promotion and, and, and working uh, bottom up and up bottom. And we need that uh, yeah. all of citizens, but all of industry uh, uh, work in, in, this, in this way. Thank you very much. I think it's uh, very exciting, your work. Uh, and uh, I think this idea of, uh, of the C40 network that we can share uh, ideas, results, evaluations uh, is very, very important for all of us. Uh, for all of us. I hope you uh, enjoy this panel, the next panels, uh, and your stay in Barcelona. Thank you very much for the panelists. <laughs>
el 93% de los niños menores de 18 años, alrededor de 630 millones de niños menores de 5 años en el mundo están expuestos a partículas contaminantes que pueden dañar su salud. Hay 543 mil muertes de niños menores de 5 años, 52 mil muertes en niños entre 5 y 15 años. Se, atribu se atribuyeron el año 2016 a efectos conjuntos de la contaminación ambiental y doméstica. ¿Puede haber algo más relevante en el trabajo inmediato, urgente, del C40 que salvar vidas? Yo creo que la respuesta es no. Y por eso, cuando nuestras ciudades toman la determinación de ponerse en acción, porque aquí efectivamente el panel dice ciudades que hacen o que trabajan, ¿no? que trabajan por esto. Nuestras ciudades se ponen en acción cuando toman medidas. Y nuestras ciudades deben ponerse de acuerdo. Esto no puede ser una discusión transitoria. Esta debe ser una discusión de Estado que se mantenga en el tiempo. No puede ser dependiente del color político. Quiero decirles que en Chile, en particular en la región metropolitana, llevamos 30 años, 30 años de éxitos y de fracasos en el combate a la contaminación ambiental. Y hemos avanzado mucho, pero nos falta mucho todavía. ¿Y por qué hemos avanzado tanto en este periodo? Porque tomamos la posta unos a otros, independiente del color político, y continuamos lo bueno hecho por los gobiernos anteriores. No hubo retroceso, solo avanzar. Y es así como pasamos de una cantidad enorme de episodios críticos a ir disminuyendo a pesar de que seguimos teniendo con el cambio climático condiciones muy adversas en nuestra región, una, geogra una geografía muy adversa. No tuvimos casi lluvia durante este invierno pasado. Tuvimos malas condiciones de ventilación. Y así todo, así todo, no retrocedimos. Porque seguimos haciendo lo que hay que hacer. Controlar las contaminaciones, las, las fuentes fijas de contaminación, las empresas que deben parar. Porque estamos tomando medidas con el transporte, el transporte privado porque tenemos que avanzar hacia un transporte público eficiente, porque todos los gobiernos han ido, han ido ampliando el metro, el transporte eléctrico, el transporte sustentable, porque avanzamos hacia una región que entiende que tenemos que marcar la diferencia. Y eso yo creo que es fundamental hoy día en el panel. Yo conversaba con la alcaldesa de Madrid, por ahí está, ahí está la alcaldesa, muy temprano hoy día en la mañana, y ella me comentaba al respecto de los problemas que están teniendo en Madrid. Y yo, desde el cono sur, desde Santiago de Chile, yo decía, yo pensaba que esos problemas no estaban en Madrid. Y ella me comentaba que hoy día hay discusión de lo que a nosotros nos parecía que no debe discutirse. Avanzar hacia sectores más caminables, más pedaleables, más sustentables, con más área verde, más amigables. Hoy día es discusión, entiendo, en Madrid. Entonces, la reflexión que yo quiero hacer y el debate que creo plantearle a nuestros panelistas es si podemos confiarnos de que todo lo avanzado no retrocede. Porque ahí tenemos un gran riesgo de creer que hemos avanzado y quedarnos en el statu quo y tal vez darnos cuenta de que lugares y ciudades líderes 
no avanzan lo que tienen que avanzar y no guían lo que tienen que guiar. El C40 tiene la responsabilidad de guiar, pero también de no detenerse. Entonces, cuando decimos que vamos a avanzar al 2030 para poder bajar lo máximo que se pueda combustibles fósiles en nuestra región metropolitana, es ponernos un desafío mucho más grande que el 2050 de la neutralidad. Porque uno tiene que apostar. Porque uno tiene que jugársela. Y no tiene que seguir siempre haciendo lo mismo. Tiene que mantener lo bueno, sí. Pero tiene que apostar a hacer las cosas de una manera diferente. No vamos a lograr resultados diferentes haciendo lo mismo. Y es ese el desafío de las ciudades líderes del C40. Yo creo que este panel nos va a dejar muchas interrogantes, como las que me dejó a mí la alcaldesa de Madrid en la mañana. Pero lo que sí les puedo decir, y por eso me siento tan honrada de abrir este panel como médico que soy, como salubrista que soy, que la acción contra el cambio climático, la acción contra la contaminación de nuestras ciudades es protección de los más vulnerables, de los que más nos necesitan y salva vidas. No lo olviden nunca. Muchísimas gracias. Well, what, what a fantastic introduction that was uh, to this panel. And that very clear message about the responsibility uh, that we, we all have. We're, this is about saving lives uh, and the speed and urgency uh, that we, we need and constantly moving up ambition. And that is indeed what our panel is now going to discuss. So if I could welcome to the stage, please, our panelists, uh, Massimiliano De Martin, uh, the Deputy Mayor for Environment uh, for Venice. Uh, Marius Frankowski, a city councillor and chairperson of the Economic Development Committee of the City of Warsaw, I think any seat you like. Uh, and Ines Sabanes, uh, Deputy Mayor for Environment and Mobility in Madrid. Let's give them all a warm welcome. <laughs> so, Deputy Mayor, if I could perhaps start with you. Um, while Ines is, is taking to the stage. Um, we've all seen on our television screens, computer screens, uh, the terrible flooding that's been afflicting uh, <laughs> Venice in <laughs> recent weeks. Um, clearly a city that's at the very form and form forefront of the impacts of climate change uh, now. Uh, and you're, you're really moving on this. You announced recently that you're going to upgrade your climate plans so that they're fully in line with what the latest science has told us means staying within a band of not allowing global temperatures to increase by more than 1.5 degrees. Perhaps just to frame this whole discussion, can you give us a, an idea of how, of how Venice is, is framing that climate and environmental action? More you want. Grazie. Uh, Innanzitutto per l'invito e per aver invitato non, non me ma la città a presenziare a, questa, a questo evento. Vorrei però innanzitutto dare un, un piccolo scenario, fare un attimo un, un, un passaggio. Eh, quando si parla di Venezia nell'immaginario di tutti, tutti pensano all'isola come centro storico e alla sua laguna. Quello è solo la metà del territorio comunale. L'altra metà del territorio è la terraferma. Ah che spesso e volentieri non è nota, non è conosciuta, ma quando parlo di 155 km di piste ciclabili, certo non le vado a descrivere e non le annuncio, perché sono fatte nel centro storico della città, ma nell'entroterra. Mm -hmm. Quindi il grosso dell'amministrazione eh, eh, sì, eh, lo sta investendo proprio nella gestione, nella terraferma, dove vivono eh, eh, quasi il doppio delle persone del centro storico della città e della sua laguna. È una città piccola nelle sue dimensioni rispetto a molte altre città eh, che sono iscritte ai Sea Fortin. Fa 260.000 persone nel suo insieme. Nel centro storico della città ci sono 80.000 persone, quando 190.000 circa vivono solo nella terraferma. Quando parlo di terraferma do anche una dimensione infrastrutturale della città di Venezia, perché c'è il terzo aeroporto d'Italia, un aeroporto intercontinentale, 
ha l'area industriale più grande d'Italia e una delle più grandi in Europa con 2.200 ettari, ha il, quarto, il quinto porto mercantile eh, dell'economia italiana, ha la quarta stazione eh, ferroviaria eh, d'Italia e il quarto transito per eh, autostrade eh, del, sempre del sistema di trasporto italiano. È su un asse ideale per la comunicazione non solo locale ma anche per il nord Europa e per l'est Europa. Siamo a poche centinaia di, di chilometri da questi confini dove c'è un transito di economia trasfrontaliera che incide per il suo passaggio anche nella qualità di vita della città. È una città, eh, Venezia, che con i suoi 260.000 abitanti ospita circa 30 milioni di turisti all'anno. Quindi la capacità attrattiva per motivi storico, culturali, artistici, artistici ed eventi anche eh, moderni è sempre fonte di attrazione. Quindi se dovessi parlare da amministratore dei miei cittadini dico sarebbe così semplice gestire 260.000 persone, ma con tutto questo indotto io non gestisco solo la mia città. Gestisco tutte quelle persone che giustamente vogliono venire in città e la città li accoglierà sempre a braccia aperte. Quindi ecco perché è interessante partecipare a contesti di queste dimensioni, perché comunque il verbo deve trasferirsi anche in altre nazioni. Chi viene da Parigi, chi viene da Londra, chi viene da Barcellona, chi viene da New York, chi viene da Mosca, comunque la città li ospita. Questo incide anche nella nostra qualità di vita come cittadini e come residenti. Devo dire che la, la città sta assumendo delle iniziative abbastanza restrittive per cercare di accelerare un cambiamento delle costruzioni. Noi abbiamo un parco immobiliare di fabbricati che sono stati costruiti eh, dagli, dal dopoguerra d'oggi che incide nel 70% delle loro, de, 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 degli edifici eh, costruiti e quindi sono edifici molto eh, energivori, che consumano molta energia. Stiamo scrivendo proprio il regolamento edilizio che eh, nella primavera del 2019 andrà invece a dare dei parametri qualitativi non solo per il nuovo costruito, ma soprattutto per rimettere e, e riattare quegli immobili che sono stati costruiti con altre tecniche, con altri standard e materiali che non, non troverebbero oggi eh, utilizzo nelle costruzioni. Stiamo lavorando soprattutto anche allo guardo eh, 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 nell'azzeramento del consumo di suolo. C'è una legge regionale che impone di non consumare più suolo con, i nuovi, eh, con nuove costruzioni, ma di rigenerarsi e quindi di fare anche una nuova urbanistica. Ecco, eventi come questi servono per dire insieme, soprattutto per alcune nazioni, io parlo per la mia, eh, dove dal dopoguerra ad oggi si è pensato sempre a un'urbanistica che ha sviluppato i territori. Oggi pensare, bisogna pensare a un'urbanistica invece che contiene i territori deve implodere, deve rigenerare, però anche con nuove norme che possano permettere e facilitare questo tipo di interventi. Stiamo pensando di lavorare anche in un ecodistretto dove abbiamo una municipalizzata che è molto all'avanguardia sul recupero anche del, del, dei rifiuti e con questa stiamo cercando di eh, rigenerare e di riportare un'energia locale proprio anche dei prodotti che vengono riciclati nel nostro territorio. Quindi un consumo, un'economia eh, chiusa della, eh, della, eh, de, de, degli scarti. Mi fa piacere aver sentito poco fa che eh, eh, bisogna andare al di là degli, eh, degli stereotipi e, e politici e ideologici. Bisogna pensare, e io sono di questa idea, che l'ambiente non ha colore politico. L'ambiente, perché trovi una sua applicazione, deve essere un, un, un bene, una parola a, alla portata di tutti. Va bene salvaguardare anche la qualità della vita, quindi la qualità della nostra salute, ma soprattutto abbiamo un debito nei confronti della natura che deve essere saldato nel più breve tempo possibile. E mi fa piacere riprendere anche un passaggio del Ministro questa mattina quando ha detto che non dobbiamo essere temerari ma audaci, fare eh, una politica audace nei confronti dell'ambiente. Della, uh, dell e io penso che le realtà locali abbiano una velocità diversa delle politiche nazionali. Per tanti motivi e tanti equilibri, spesso e volentieri, eh, non si riesce a fare una politica armoniosa in tutto il territorio nazionale. Però penso e vedo che in realtà dove ci sono amministrazioni anche di colori diversi, comunque gli amministratori sono sensibili al problema, si riesce a intervenire in modo molto rapido. And so the, moving from that, you know, it's, uh, how you're improving density, tackling waste, creating that kind of closed loop um, economy. But 
specifically then moving on to the question of air pollution. Um, Venice, a wealthy city, but last year you exceeded European health standards on air pollution, like many other Euro European cities, exacerbated in your case by some extreme temperatures. What are you now specifically doing in brief to tackle air pollution? Devo dire con soddisfazione che partecipare ai SIF Fortini è stato utile per noi come amministrazione perché abbiamo, eh, siamo intervenuti sul piano d'azione, un impegno che ci siamo presi due anni fa dopo Città del Messico. Abbiamo avuto incontri proprio con la direzione eh, europea dei, dei SIF Fortini e abbiamo intrapreso un percorso di crescita sia come personale della pubblica amministrazione, quindi lavorando molto in housing e quindi è stato anche interessante sotto il profilo della crescita qualitativa dei pubblici dipendenti, ma soprattutto abbiamo lavorato su un documento che trovi coerenza con gli standard di Safe Forti. E è vero che, come ho detto prima, tutte quelle infrastrutture che sono ospiti nel nostro territorio comunale incidono pesantemente, ma non è solo una produzione creata per il consumo locale. Eh, però noi dobbiamo farne i conti come amministratori in quel territorio dove abbiamo accettato comunque di avere queste infrastrutture. E ci ha fatto capire una cosa, che poi così tanto indietro non lo siamo. La deadline sul 2020, il documento che abbiamo redatto, ci fa capire che con un'analisi chiusa nel piano d'azione al 31 dicembre del 2016, noi abbiamo già raggiunto la riduzione del 20%. Siamo fuori con dei dati ancora da analizzare, ma da inserire con eh, dati anno 2017 e 2018, che sono molto più performanti. Quindi il lavoro grosso della nostra città l'abbiamo fatto, ma questo non vuol dire abbiamo finito i compiti. Comunque abbiamo delle attività dove andremo a lavorare molto sui mezzi di trasporto. Abbiamo già eh, fatto degli investimenti e degli atti deliberativi, quindi degli atti pubblici, dove ci impegniamo, ci siamo già impegnati ad acquisire nuovi mezzi, sia su quelli gommati che vanno su, stra su strada, sia con delle azioni anche di utilizzo di, nuovi, eh, di nuovo carburante, con un accordo fatto dalla città di Venezia, dalla nostra municipalizzata dei trasporti e da ENI, che è l'ente nazionale degli idrocarburi in Italia, che con il riciclo del, dell'olio eh, 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 domestico per uso alimentare viene riciclato per fare eh, eh, alimentazione della flotta di mezzi di trasporto in acqua. Perché non abbiamo solo la, la parte gommata per i 190.000 abitanti della terraferma, Abbiamo anche un trasporto di flotta eh, di navigazione molto consistente che riguarda sia il trasporto pubblico ma soprattutto anche il trasporto di, di, di raccolta della spazzatura. Great, well we, we are delighted at C40 that you've chosen to take that 1.5 degree target and we very much look forward to supporting you uh, in revising your plan to meet it. But let's move now from Venice uh, to Warsaw. Councillor, you've just had elections for the mayor. W was air pollution an issue in those elections? And, and what, what's the, the agenda of the new mayor on this subject? Actually, the um, uh, air pollution was one of the major, major uh, uh, campaign uh, slogan uh, used by all, almost all of the candidates. Mm -hmm. And we, sp we, we had uh, 13 candidates. Wow. And almost all of them, they we're talking about the air pollution, air quality, so it was a big issue. And uh, actually, Ms. the new mayor, Mr. Chaskowski, uh, he will uh, take over the office next week, okay. and then he's going to appoint uh, new uh, deputy mayors. And uh, during the campaign, uh, he's former, uh, it's, it's important, I think, he's a former member of the European Parliament, and he used to be also a deputy, deputy minister of digitalization and administration, and then deputy uh, minister of uh, foreign affairs. So he is really familiar with the EU climate, uh, climate policy, and he is really dedicated to, to fight for the climate change. And also uh, he is dedicated to change the policy. Of course, for the last 12 years, m most of the job is done by the former mayor, uh, Mrs. Uh, Hanna gronkiewicz waltz uh, he, he was a mayor, so he still, she, she still is a mayor uh, for the last uh, 12 years. And, uh, and the Warsaw changed uh, change a lot since for these 12 years. 
uh, when you're talking about the air pollution, for example, we finished the first metro line, and now uh, every day metro line in Warsaw, the first metro line, is used daily by almost half a million people. And uh, we also start to building a second line, which will be finished uh, by the end of 2023. And uh, only this line now is used by 150,000 people every day. So altogether, it's 700,000 people. And we do uh, a lot of work uh, to encourage people to use public transport instead of, uh, instead of cars. We also renovate our tram system. We're building uh, another two tram lines. We also completely change our bus, uh, bus fleet uh, completely. I mean, 1,000 old buses, mostly diesel buses, were uh, now uh, changed for, uh, for a new ones. Uh, not, of course, some of them are electric buses. Uh, some of them are use uh, gas system, but we are also planning to buy uh, new buses next year. 130 new electric buses uh, will be bought, and also more than 100 uh, will, will, which will be powered by gas. So, but we also uh, completely change uh, our uh, way of thinking about uh, commute to work. We invest in uh, park and ride system. We build 16 park and ride. Uh, so it's a whole network, only in Warsaw, but also expanding this to the metropolitan area. So our commune and cities around Warsaw they are also building uh, a park and ride. So altogether in the metropolitan area of Warsaw will be 50 park and ride, which will help people to commute to, to work using uh, public transport, different means of transport. I mean trains, uh, but also uh, buses, and also, uh, of course, subway. Uh, we do, uh, one of the main causes of air pollution and, uh, is uh, unfortunately the, the old system of heating. Uh, even though we have 80% uh, of cities covered by the district heating, we still have this outside district, uh, are still have problems with uh, the coal, coal furnaces especially in the individual houses. So this is one of the more, uh, one of the main cause of the air pollution. So we want to, uh, next year we want to change and completely remove all of the, uh, of the, of this coal heated furnaces in houses uh, by the end of the next year and in all the public, uh, public houses. So it's around 17,000, so it's still a, still a lot. So it's... I mean, it's a huge program you, you've talked about there, and, and Warsaw has been a very active city in C40 for, for many years. One of the things you mentioned there on, on the buses, you're, you're a signatory to the Green Healthy Streets, which is a commitment uh, of cities, now 26 cities across the world, to, to try and shift the global market towards zero emission buses. So. In, to only purchase zero emission buses from 2025 at the latest and then make a ma major area of the city completely free of fossil fuel powered vehicles. H how, how, useful, how important is that for you to be part of that kind of international collaboration? And how much does it help you in delivering your own targets in your city? It's help us, it helps us a lot. I mean, we, we change our also the strategy so and we want to move Warsaw 2030 strategy is concentrate uh, on pedestrians and uh, and also for in the m m on the public spaces so we want to have more public spaces give more public spaces to the people uh, so uh, this this part of uh, of this agreement uh, was and changing all the the fleet and uh, it's going to help us uh, also invest in electric buses as i said as i said before and we also uh, want to modernize our transport to be more energy efficient and uh, more encourage more people to use public transport, but also uh, encourage people to use bikes, for example. Uh, we built, uh, for the last 12 years, we built uh, almost 400 new kilometers of bikeways. And uh, we also introduced a veteran system, which is a bike rental system. Uh, in, in 2012, and now it's the fifth biggest 
uh, bike rental system in Europe, m more than 5,000 bicycles. So uh, we also, so we th that's our uh, goals, and that's why uh, we signed this, this agreement. Great, and I, well, I haven't visited for a few years. I look forward to, to using the, the, the new cycle hire scheme. We must move now Thank to you. Madrid uh, and Deputy Mayor. Uh, and you've launched Plan A, because there's no Plan B, um, which I'll let, let you explain, but it includes some really dramatic measures, including restricting traffic in the city of Madrid. Give us a sense of what Plan A is all about, please. Bueno, fundamentalmente que um, Madrid incumple las recomendaciones, las directrices y los niveles de Organización Mundial de la Salud y de la Unión Europea desde el año 2010. Por tanto, desde luego que no hay plan B, hay un, un, una necesidad de tomar medidas. Eh, se ha perdido mucho tiempo y, por tanto, las medidas son una emergencia de salud pública por cuanto tenemos episodios anuales, numerosos, de superación de los niveles eh, puntualmente. Que hemos hecho dos cuestiones. La primera es actuación a través de un protocolo cuando suben los niveles de contaminación, los medidores, toda la red de medición del aire de la ciudad, repartida por la ciudad. Cuando superamos los niveles, aplicamos un protocolo de intervención, por lo cual pues va desde, desde la reducción de velocidad hasta... La discriminación, bueno, la primera vez que lo aplicamos fue por matrículas, pares e impares, eh, en el escenario más grave. Y bueno, ahora lo hemos cambiado por eh, tecnología de vehículos. Esas serían las medidas de impacto cuando suben los niveles. Pero las medidas estructura, estructurales se concentran en el plan A de calidad de aire y cambio climático. Dos lecciones aprendidas. Una, tenemos que incorporar para no equivocarnos en las medidas como se han equivocado las distintas administraciones, hemos incorporado plan lucha contra la contaminación y prevención y adaptación al cambio climático para que las medidas tengan una coherencia y no haya problema de eh, impulsar una tecnología para años después, es decir, que esa tecnología pues, afecta a las emisiones, etcétera, etcétera, para tener una coherencia en las medidas. Eh, por otro lado, eh, el plan A no es una política sectorial. En el Ayuntamiento de Madrid el medio ambiente no es una política sectorial. Es una, digamos, que incorpora eh, las necesidades básicas y abarca, son 30 medidas que abarcan todas las medidas de movilidad, las medidas de transición y cambio energético, las medidas de renaturalización eh, o de... Eh, de infraestructura verde en el ámbito de la ciudad y las, las medidas eh, de tratamiento y de prevención de residuos. Esos son los bloques principales que comprenden las 30 medidas, que tienen una mirada sobre lo concreto, sobre el día a día, pero tienen una mirada estratégica que nos permite hoy poder decir que creo que podemos mm, a, a firmar este compromiso porque... Eh, y digamos que a pesar de que es una ciudad que tiene serios problemas de contaminación, tiene una, o pretende tener una mirada estratégica que supere el, el periodo puramente electoral. Eh, por eso, por ejemplo, estamos tomando ahora, implantando una medida que parece que tiene una, una cierta controversia, <risa> que es el Madrid Central, que es la restricción en un, en un ámbito central del acceso de vehículos en, nivel, en función de su nivel de contaminación o de su tecnología de vehículos y está prácticamente reservada el área central para residentes, transporte público y todo el conjunto de excepciones y servicios que es muy importante y ya con eso tiene un impacto. Bueno, esos son es el objetivo del plan A de calidad de aire y lucha contra el cambio climático que pretendemos con ello pues eh, eliminar eh, o desde luego cumplir. Nos hemos comprometido, nosotros estamos muy intervenidos por la Unión Europea y mandamos resultados de nuestras medidas prácticamente cada dos meses, ¿eh? explicando con, cuánto hemos renovado toda la flota de, estamos terminando de renovar la flota de autobuses, toda la flota de servicios municipales prácticamente, quedaría la de concesionarias, ha empleado la red de carriles bus, en fin, son una serie de medidas 
que, eh, que definen cómo, querré, cómo queríamos que fuese la ciudad o cómo debería de ser la ciudad en el 20, en el 30 y en el 50. Con vocación de consenso, pero no con consenso real en este momento. Can you, we, we have a, a terrible clock in front of us that's flashing that we've run out of time, but I want to ask one very quick final question, because you mentioned the European Union and that it's monitoring you to ensure that you deliver on air quality, but you've also taken the extraordinary measure with Paris and Brussels of taking the European Union to court because of the, their weakening of regulation around diesel vehicles. Just tell us in 30 seconds, if you can, why you did that and if you're going to be successful. Bueno, porque creemos que tiene que ser una acción muy directa de la Unión Europea en cuanto a las restricciones del diésel y, por tanto, armonizar todas las normativas y no sufrir retraso, retrasos en su, eh, en su exigencia, porque mm, a nivel de calidad de aire y lucha contra el cambio climático no llegamos, sencillamente. Con tanta moratoria acabamos por no llegar. <risa> All right. It's a very clear note to end on. We have to release you now to a network break. There's tea and coffee uh, served outside. But first, a big round of applause to our fantastic panel. Thank you very much. Welcome to the third and last session on climate change thematic panel within the Smart City Expo. I'm Luigi Caraffa, Executive Director of the Climate Infrastructure Partnership. And I'm very glad to moderate today this third panel uh, focusing on climate change in cities in developing countries. Uh, it's my uh, very pleasure to have as uh, keynote speakers today, Mr. Kostli Chansa, Director of Town Planning and Estate Services at the Blentari City Council in Malawi, and Mr. Murad Diaye, Secretary General of the Dakar City Council. So without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Chansa. Um, oh, it's okay. Yeah, it's here. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, good afternoon. Uh, my presentation is on role of cities in climate change adaptation in developing countries. This is a case study for Blanta City in Malawi, that's Africa. Uh, in most situations when you're talking about climate change, people normally have got uh, issues on increasing energy efficiency, phasing out fossil fuels, reducing the carbon energy, removing carbon dioxide from the earth atmosphere, issues of pollution. Most people look into those as the main thing of mitigating climate change. But I'd like us to take another position in how cities can also play a role in reducing carbon. In their way, also trying to take their role in climate change adaptation. Now, for us to understand the presentation, I will try to look at uh, the relationship of urbanization, population, and climate change. Because in most cities, population and urbanization, they play a key role in how a city is defined. So we're going to look at uh, cities as being contributors to climate change, but also cities as bearing the blunt of climate change. And finally, but not least, cities as places of climate change solutions. So in a final analysis, we are going to see that the cities are as vulnerable as they are as powerful. Now let me explore this population, urbanization, and climate change cocktail. You know, in 2011, the seventh billion citizens came on Earth. And by 2050, there will be two million people. Globally, we're in the urban age. Since 2007, we have had half of the world living in urban areas. Now, Africa itself will enter the urban age by 2030. 
where 50% of the people will be in urban areas, 50% in the rural areas. In my country, we may have to wait a little more, about 2050, when we have these 50% people staying in urban areas. Now, let's look at the urban, urbanization population and urbanization relationship. When you have high fertility rates, it means the population will increase. Now, when the population increases, there will be a lot of pressure on the resources. For instance, less land holding per capita, less resources per capita, resource degradation, land also less to support the growing population. This will eventually lead to people migrating from rural areas to urban areas. And it also leads to urban urbanization and eventually slum formation. Now, the connection between urbanization and climate change. We have urbanization, which will lead to occupational industrialization. If there's high urbanization, people still need to come up with a way of life, a lot of activities. These will lead to inward flow of food, energy, and other goods. These will be the associated act, uh, activities in the urban areas. At the end of the day, all these activities will lead to greenhouse emissions in terms of energy, transportation. People will be flocking from other areas of the city to the inner city to their uh, workplaces. Accumulation of waste, a lot of buildings, a reduction of forestry, and quite a number of things which eventually will lead to greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions. Now, another linkage that would like, uh, I would like also you to take note is on the population and climate change. Linkage can be more complicated depending on level of analysis. For instance, in developing countries with the lower rates of population growth, there is high per capita greenhouse gas emissions, that are, for instance, in Africa. Africa with high population growth has low per capita greenhouse gases emissions and it contributes only 5% of emissions. Now, the climate change is driven more by production and consumption patterns of affluent communities than by population growth and size. Another important area that also we need to know is that uh, population size in Africa matters more when it comes to scale of consequences and adverse impact of climate change. So the scale is ultimately determined by number of people affected. Though contributing little to greenhouse gas emissions, Africa is exposed to climate hazards for a variety of reasons. Rapid urbanization growth happening together with rapid urbanization. Rapid population growth happening together with rapid urbanization. Often this leads into informal settlements, which amplify disaster risk in the urban areas. Now, let's now move to cities and climate change adaptation. We've talked about the linkages between population and urbanization, urbanization and climate change. Now let's move to cities and climate change ad ad adaptation. Normally when you are living in a city, there are quite a number of issues that people may just forego, but which are so important. Like for instance, cities all over the world, they, are, they act like seats of political and governance position. That's where you have the capital cities. They are also considered as dairy greenhouse emissions. Over 80% of greenhouse gas emissions, they come from cities. And dead cities only occupy about 2% of the land. But at the same time, cities are also considered as engines of economic growth. 65% of GDP in most countries comes from cities. They have got various roles at local level, like uh, taxation issues, urban planning. And they have also got other roles, like in terms of transportation costs, location of facilities. They are all determined by cities. So what we can deduce is that cities should therefore play major roles in climate change interventions because of their position. Now, if you look at this picture, this slide, you see that um, there are quite a number of land uses. There is energy, transportation, buildings, industry, agriculture, and forestry. Cities, I said earlier on, they cover only 2% of Earth's surface. But 80% of greenhouse gases are coming from cities. So you look at the global greenhouse gas percentage contribution by activity. If you look at the, the activity, you see that much of the activities are coming from cities, like energy, transportation, buildings, industry, waste, they're all coming from cities. But if you look at agriculture, maybe predominantly it could be rural, but there's also some aspects that also are covered by cities. So all in all, 80% of greenhouse gases coming from cities, yet they're occupying 2% of air surface. Now, what should be the urban local authority 
dividend. As I said earlier on, cities have got the multiple, role, multiple roles, like uh, the regulators, taxation licensing authorities, there are also strategic land use planners and developers, there are also consumers of goods and services, and there are also providers of goods and services. Therefore, the local authority dividend makes local authority exceptionally well positioned to lead and influence climate change interventions. They can stimulate behavior change among citizens and businesses. Now, let's look from the angle of urban planning and management. Planning, I'll give an, still give an example in Africa. Planning in African cities, they promote or promotion of highly dispersed cities with long commuting distances. If you go to African cities, you see that most of the low-income people, they are located outside, in the urban fringe, outside the cities. So in that case, they, they promote long distances to their workplaces. These people, they use transport, public transport, which means that there'll be a lot of pollution because people are moving out of the city, coming to the city and back and forth like that. Then you have got also low-income housing located on city peripherals and beyond. Poor public transport, which leads to bias towards private cars. There is an influx of private cars in African cities these days. People buying second-hand vehicles from China or from Japan. This is also increasing pollution in the cities. Congestion and poorly maintained vehicles. They are all factors that are contributed by planning in African cities, which to a certain extent leading to pollution, climate change issues. So local authorities can lead and influence the reduction of urban dependence on oil and carbon footprints if the towns are properly planned. If people are not located outside urban fringes, they are very close to their workplaces, there is mixed land use. All those factors can be sorted by the city councils, by the cities themselves. In the final analysis, this will now have like a mitigation measure for uh, climate change. Now, what can local authorities do? They should get involved in spatial planning, which is a key mandate of local authorities, promoting neighborhood and layout building designs that promote shorter commuting and energy efficiency. Location of facilities, location of infrastructure, location of people where people should stay should be closer to workplaces to ensure that we are reducing pollution through vehicular use. Should also be increased urban development densities Many people should be staying in a particular area, like, unlike maybe having low densities where people, few people are staying in a particular area. Promote mixed land uses to ensure that people don't move around. They can find their services within their neighborhood. Integrate green policies in municipal laws. Most of the municipal laws are outdated. They need to be revised to ensure that they have got a, a footprint on uh, climate change issues. Should also promote effective approaches in designing and implementing cities without slums to reduce informality in these cities. After doing all these things, urban planning is considered as being a fundamental climate change mitigation and adaptation. So what can urban planning do? Valuation tool for mainstreaming disaster risk reduction into urban development processes. Needs to ensuring that construction meets minimum standards of disaster resilience and now looking at development control. Good urban planning should ensure that there's good development control in urban cities so that we can have minimum standards of disaster resilient buildings. Most of the people are, are from the low income bracket, so their houses may not be as strong as those that are in the high income bracket. So there is need to come up with the construction regulations that should also target these low income people to ensure that they're coming up with infrastructure that is resilient. Uh, protecting critical infrastructure and services, and also post-disaster construction of human settlements. When disasters strike, there should be a deliberate move to ensure that uh, reconstruction of human settlements is done timely to avoid uh, further accidents. So urban planning offers opportunities to improve sustainability of settlements and effectively prepare communities against risk. Uh, my time is almost over, so just one second. What are the picture that I'm showing you is the guidelines for safer housing construction that should be targeting the low-income people. People should come up with the guidelines for low-income construction of houses. Yeah, that's a hardware solution where buildings should also meet
climate conditions to ensure that we are minimizing um, climate e change issues. So what are the challenges? Despite the decentralization, local authorities still remain weak. The lack of capacity for knowledge and data climate, the lack of skills to design and implement strategies that address climate change issues. Therefore, cities need to support to build their capacities if they are to play their role in climate change mitigation and adaptation. UN Habitat has also demonstrated this by coming up with cities and climate change initiative. They have the, what they call SUD Net, uh, which is the Sustainable Urban Development Network, an innovation ne innovative network of global partners working with actors and networks to promote multilateral and interdisciplinary approach to sustainable urban development. There are also issues of a regional center for disaster risk reduction in Africa, all targeting climate change adaptation. But for the urban poor, they are the highest risk because the location of vulnerable to floods and landslides, infrastructure is weak and lacking, housing is substandard, the recovery from disaster is difficult for the poor, and there is also no legal protection, including legal tenure for the housing sites. So what we need to think forward is that climate change in Africa is heavily focused on agriculture without establishing linkages with urbanization. This is a high time we should include urbanization issues into uh, climate change. But you also need to ensure that population growth, urbanization, and climate change issues should be addressed together and not one with climate change, but addressing them as a cocktail together. Uh, urban poor normally are left out of safetyness, and the climate change agenda is normally in the mistaken belief that urban areas are better off. But there are some poor areas in urban areas, poor areas in urban or in cities, which are much worse than those that are staying in the rural areas. Finally, but not least, we need to mainstream climate change in all forms of urban planning and management. Uh, the last slide I've, I'm showing you is about a goal of my presentation, urban climate resilience. You look at it, you see that uh, when cities are being constructed, they follow a certain urban system. When the problem is coming in, they need to be withstand and they eventually recover from those risks quickly from any possible hazard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chansa, for this interesting and inspiring presentation. I think it's, it's very important to hear uh, direct stories from you know, other uh, developing regions like Africa. It's amazing that only if we do not take into account climate change, only because of population growth and economic growth, cities in developing regions will be certainly under stress. Uh, there, are, there is a lot of pressure that is coming just from these two things. But if we further add even the pressures coming from global warming and climate change, especially in those regions, developing regions within the tropics and near the equator, we have another factor of stress which really makes cities in developing regions major players if we really want to fight climate change and if we want to achieve sustainable development. So I'm very glad now to give the word to Mr. Murad Diay, Secretary General at, of the Dakar City Council. Murad, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizer to, for inviting us to share experience of uh, Dakar addressing uh, climate, climate change. Uh, <clears throat> maybe you should know that uh, we have been asked a little late to make this presentation. Uh, so uh, I'm with my friend and colleagues, Alamin Sise from the program, uh, UN Habitat uh, Profiling Program in, uh, in Dakar. And this morning we wanted to, to share how in Dakar we are addressing climate change, uh, going through the context and some experience. But first, uh, let me introduce, and uh, just for you to know about Dakar. Dakar is the capital of Senegal, and it's uh, located in the western part of Africa, in the Atlantic, and uh, it's uh, less than 2% of the national territory with a concentration of uh, more than 80% of economi uh, economic activities. So in a, it's a peninsula, it's a small peninsula, uh, but uh, Dakar itself, the, the city, 
is uh, about uh, 1 million population, and the region goes to about 3, three million uh, in, uh, in population. And Dakar is comprised by 19 uh, communes, which uh, are the municipal, municipal district. So um, for the process, we have uh, identified some shocks and, and stress. And uh, we have the list here. And what is the major and critical issues is the question of coastal erosion. As you, as you may know, I told that Dakar is a peninsula, and it's the western side of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of Africa in the, in the, in the Atlantic. And uh, this is uh, an issue that we are addressing, uh, uh, talking about uh, climate, climate change. And so the stress that we uh, prioritize, uh, you may know that uh, we have sort of uh, a management of uh, urban met metabolism. That is one of the issues. The growth with the population, uh, Dakar is uh, uh, feeling a problem of, uh, of uh, rural um, uh, migration, people coming from uh, the, the sub-Saharan and coming to the, the city, and that create uh, pressure on land issues, that create pressure on urbanization, that create pressure of the, in the use of uh, infrastructure, because there was not uh, enough dimension to, to carry uh, 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 all, all the people now concentrated in Dakar. We have also, in the social side, a problem of unsettlement, uh, so pity traders and informal activities on the city that create pressure on the management on the city and that also uh, take out some revenue for the, for the city. So this uh, is one of the, the stress that we, that, we, that we feel and also a huge problem on the degradation of the ecosystem with a rapid uh, urbanization and lack of sort of uh, uh, institutional and, and administrative cohesion. So just give you an idea, just on the, on the shock and the, and the stress. And as I said, for climate change, the issue is the sea level rise in Dakar, which we, which we address with some, some solution, and also the, the temperature change. Um, we've been a part of a, a program uh, called the 100 City Resilient City. Um, and the Dakar uh, used that program to make a strategy, a resilient strategy, that we can see we address uh, five uh, real big issues and, uh, and our strategic action uh, goes on that. First, promoting an inclusive resilience and agenda by and for Dakar citizens. This needs to get mobilizing and, and getting participation, inclusive participation to the, to the, to the citizen. Second is to provide a healthy living environment to uh, Dakar cities. As we mentioned in the shock, we can see that we have some sanitary problem in Africa, in some part of Africa, you may know there are some epidemics and uh, that sort of uh, issues that we should tackle. And with the migration, people coming from as a, as a country, Ivory Coast, Mali, with a system of migration, that creates shocks and that creates problem in, in Dakar. A third is sort of include a position of the private sector as a resilient partner. We've been working with the uh, private sector, uh, the, the uh, social tell societal uh, environment uh, position of some, some uh, businesses to get them involved in, in the cities and to get them involved also address uh, the, 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 climate change, the climate change issues. And uh, leverage also energy efficiency technology to support city resilience. So we can come back on that and uh, show you how in terms of practical case we've done in, uh, in, in Senegal, in Dakar. And uh, last, promote inclusive and efficient governance that is also all the partners uh, that have been uh, included in, the, in our strategy, the government, the NGOs, and all the, the whole communities on, uh, on that. In terms of program, I, as I told you, have been just asked to uh, share our experience on that. One of the main programs uh, in Senegal now going in terms of climate change is what we call the Territory Climate and Energy Plan, the PCT in French, Plan Climat Energy Territorial, uh, that we uh, use now just to address this, this issue with three main objectives. First is having a prospective vision of action and addressing climate change effect. This is very important. Sensibility, let people to know what the issues are. And second is to mobilizing communities on climate change issues. So the whole stakeholders uh, going to the government, to the city level communities, the communities themselves, and throughout all the segments, the gender issues, and all the segments of the population, uh, the, the citizens, the schools, and, uh, and uh, uh, as, a, as a sportive uh, um, sector. And last is put in place a pilot project for energy efficiency. 
I have to, to explain that we've done there is also to um, select some building of the cities that we're going through a pilot project in terms of reducing, uh, uh, doing uh, some energy efficiency. We take some administrative building of the city, the city hall, the, one of the buildings, the official building, and also some sanitary district, and we're going through there to know how we can uh, reduce uh, use of, of energy on that building, and how also we can use architecture and technology to use, make a, best, a better way and a new way to build a uh, uh, building in, uh, in, in Dakar. Uh, also, what is important on this, uh, this action, we've been uh, trying to identify, make a, a, a diagnosis on vulnerabilities on the city and also on greenhouse emission as we, we use work with my, with my friend. And Dakar also is sort of an industrial, industrial region. We have the port, we have a port, we have an, an airport, and we have some mobilities, and urban traffic is so, so dense, so we may understand that uh, we have some, some vulnerabilities and also some um, issues uh, regarding the, the uh, gas, uh, gas emission. Uh, through all this initiative, we've been working for, with partners, uh, notably the Union um, uh, 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 European, the European, and and that uh, help find find some 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 uh, find some programs, uh, notably the program on uh, on PCAT, and also as I mentioned, we've been part of the 100 resilient cities uh, that help us to make the resilient strategy uh, that with our objective, we're now uh, putting action, putting plan, and looking also for, for finance, because this is a big issue on derailing this sort of strategy. We have some problem financing some projects, and as you said, we have also some problem identifying some issues and uh, let, them, let them work. Uh, le uh, recently, we've been part of a UN Habitat Initiative. It's uh, the uh, prof uh, Resilient Providing Program, and uh, I'm with my, my colleague, Lamin, with the focal point of, uh, of uh, uh, this program in Dakar, and that's why mainly we are here, and we wanted, le yesterday we share our experience on social resilience, and uh, today we've been just asked to tell you how we're dealing with all these uh, aspects on, on, uh, on climate change. Uh, Mark was there, the executive uh, secretary on C40, Dakar is a member of the C40, and we are running this initiative with a focal point now in Dakar, helping our city, uh, through that network uh, to address and, and use. And we've been part of C uh, C40 through uh, the mayor's convention uh, on climate change, uh, where uh, the, our city council uh, signed and, and uh, is a member of that. Uh, you may know that also in Senegal regarding climate change, uh, what we call the uh, contribution national determiné is sort of the national contribution to, to, to help uh, fight uh, against uh, gas emission. Uh, at our lo local level, we have some targets, we have some objectives, but which are aligned to the strategy of the government, the Ministry of Environment in, in Senegal, uh, uh, notably, and we're working with uh, uh, NGOs and communities. And what is important here, as we mentioned, that we have a very dynamic community and that uh, we're doing some sensibilization, we're doing some uh, gathering people to address these issues, let them know, and also be part of what we're doing in the city. This inclusive approach is uh, very important for us, and uh, we think that that's the, that's the best way to, to go through that. I mentioned uh, uh, the program of, of UN Habitat, and the program now, we're going uh, forward uh, through this element. Let's build some successful partnership on that. Lessons that we've learned from other cities, that cities are member of that, that network, uh, 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 from from uh, from uh, 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 Namibia, from uh, um, Pretoria, and, and other cities, and also as I mentioned, alignment with what we have done in terms of uh, program, environmental program in Dakar and in the and in the in the um, in the country. Uh, so just considering that, these are the critical issues with this program and what we've done when on on climate change. Uh, what we wanted uh, this morning, lately, to share with people and uh, hoping that uh, it's great. We wanted just to say thank you to you. Uh, merci, as you said in French, and uh, gracias in English. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Murad. I, since we're running uh, late, I would like to open the floor uh, to questions. So please raise your hands if you have questions regarding this topic. I 
Okay, one question. Is there a microphone? Please, if you may uh, introduce yourself and... Yeah, of course. Um, my name is uh, Tyne Kroon. I'm a, a physical geography student from King's College in London. And I was wondering uh, whether the gentlemen were uh, looking into public-private partnerships to, uh, to invest, to make the, the beautiful uh, uh, solutions they come up with, uh, to make them happen, uh, or whether they uh, are looking for uh, solely public investments to make them happen. So that's my question. Thank you very much. Other questions before we... Okay, I don't see any any other questions from the floor. May I, may I please uh, invite Murade and Kostli to come over? Uh, So I think we have one but very interesting question. Uh, would you like to would you like to interact regarding this question? Yeah. We need a microphone here. Costly. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, involvement of public private sector is paramount in ensuring that city councils or cities are mitigating the climate change issue. Um, we came up with a number of areas that you can see institutions can, inter uh, can get in. But on the part of private uh, intervention, it could be in transportation system, even in the urban planning, but also engaging the private sector to participate in uh, management of the cities. You know, these days, it's no longer that the cities should be managed by the government only, or the local councils, or local authorities. It's everybody's responsibility to ensure that all issues affecting the cities are being done in a proper manner. Uh, how can they get engaged? City councils can play a role of being maybe like a supervisor. You can have this wide stakeholder participation in a number of areas, whether it's environment, whether it's um, infrastructure development and all other issues that participate in city development. So the PPP situation can come in, whether it's uh, infrastructure development, environment, water and sanitation, they can come in. In that process, they will help a lot in reducing uh, the issue of climate change. Thank you, Costly. Murad, would you like to interact also on yes. PPPs? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think that uh, this issue depends also on the on the sector. In Senegal, we have some uh, PPPs uh, initiatives on some aspects on on water, on on build, uh, huge investment or, or, or buildings. Uh, otherwise, we have what we call some concession. Uh, it's uh, sort of the contract uh, between the the city and and uh, and, uh, and businesses, and uh, that's the way to w the way it goes in in Senegal. And mainly also. Uh, we have some initiatives, but uh, just the private sector helping the city in uh, their engagement on uh, business social uh, responsibilities. It's sort of fund and sort of help on that. But mainly to answer the question, uh, we get some possibilities in PPPs uh, in some sector on that. Thank you very much. We are running uh, out of time, but I will really, uh, to wrap up, I will really make a, a point. I, I really believe that there is a, a clearly a lack of awareness about uh, the problems that are happening, are going to happen in cities, in developing regions of the world, because there is where we have the biggest and strongest pressures coming, not only from climate change, but also from all the other problems and issues like population growth, infrastructure gap, uh, economic growth. And there is clearly a lack of awareness and we really have to work a lot towards raising awareness over there. And also, I think it's also important, this is also what I take away from your very inspiring presentations, that not only cities in developing regions are the ones that 
are more exposed to the impacts of climate change and other pressure factors, but also are where we can really mitigate emissions, not only adapt, but also mitigate emissions, because F cities are responsible for over 70% of global emissions, and cities in developing regions are the ones that are growing bigger and bigger, especially because of population growth and other dynamics. So we really need to prepare our future there. There is where we can really fight climate change. Definitely. Okay, and with this, ah, okay, thank you. We have some questions from the audience. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to see how uh, shy we became with technology. <laughs> We are few here in the room, but yeah, it, it's good. I will, uh, I will just pick up a couple of the questions. So the first one is uh, about Malawi. Is it possible for Malawi cities to become 100% solar cities through solar panels on rooftop, etc., as a cheaper alternative to central power stations? So costly, this is for you. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, I may not say 100%, but the initiative is there. Uh, solar panels as one way of helping out uh, hydro hydroelectricity. It is happening in our country. There are quite a number. The supply for electricity from hydro is not covering the whole area or the whole country. So there are some initiatives that are taking place, like solar panels, to ensure that other areas do access the power grid. So. The initiatives are there on the ground. So if you're not behind the percent, we're getting there. Thank you. And the last question about the car. There is uh, a colleague in the audience who, uh, that is asking, what level of sea level rise will be a serious problem for Dakar? And what response would you hope to receive from the international community regarding sea levels? Do you have any thoughts on, on this? Yeah. I mean, in terms of uh, measurement, I don't have some um, elements, but uh, um, who comes to, to Dakar or Senegal um, see that there is a big uh, erosion problem, coastal erosion problem, because when you go to the, the Cornish the Sea, you can see how the plane, the plane is uh, getting down, and uh, you can see quite critically some, some aspect on that. Uh, studies have been done by the, the government and the cities also, and it's the whole coastal area, starting from south to Senegal, which in Casamance, going to north to Saint Louis. I can mention that Saint Louis, which is a, a, a administrative city in Senegal, is so touched down now. You can see some some districts, some whole districts that are being disappearing the, from the from the map completely. So this is a, 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 a huge issues in in Dakar in Saint Louis, in Dakar, and, and, uh, and also in um, what we call uh, the Petite Côte, it's Sali. If uh, you have the chance to come to on vacation to Sali, uh, two, three years ago, you had uh, some um, uh, beach sea to go from the beach to the, to the, to the water. And the, now there is no more place. Like, you know, water camps still to the hotels and destroying everything. Uh, one of the solutions now uh, we've been, we've been uh, doing with international communities because it's a very very uh, tough and high investment is to put some some digs, you know, to put some how, I don't know how you call it in, in English, put some digs that that protects uh, uh, buildings, that protects houses uh, from the 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 the, 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 the water of the beach mm -hmm. to come, and uh, it's a huge investment. Uh, we've been helped somehow by the international communities, uh, some um, European countries, and the government is putting is putting uh, some money on that. But the risk is. In, in maybe in l less than, than 10 years, we'll have to see some, some, some whole district disappearing completely from the map and, uh, and uh, with, with all the buildings and all the stuff. So uh, definitely, mm. it's, a, it's, it's a risk uh, and uh, the level of, 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 of uh, water is, uh, is very high on, on that. Thank you very much. And I'd like to conclude this session by saying that, yeah, as, as clearly we have seen with the 1.5 uh, report from the IPCC, we really need to stay below 1.5 Celsius global warming if, if 
we want to make sure that especially developing regions will be uh, safe. Otherwise, there is scientific evidence that shows that many cities and even small, many of the small uh, state islands really run into the risk of disappearing because of the sea uh, increase, the sea rise level. Okay, thank you very much, Kostli. Thank you very much, Murad. Thanks for coming over. Thank you very much.